Hello and welcome to Lessons from Deepwater Horizon. My name is Ken Costell. I'm the Director of Research Communications at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I hope everyone is healthy and safe wherever you are. Uh, this morning we'll be talking to Chris Reddy. Chris is a marine chemist and senior scientist here in Woods Hole and someone who is very deeply involved in both the institutions and the nation's response to the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 and for several years after. Just a few quick things before we begin. If you're watching us on Zoom, you'll be able to ask questions by quick clicking on the Q&A button on your screen and typing your questions in the window that appears. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can type your questions directly into the comments. Either way, one of our team will either try to answer you or will relay your question to me to, to pose to Chris. If we don't get your question, uh, get to your question while we're live, uh, we'll try to answer it over the next couple of days. It's, it's, it's really hard to believe that it's been 10 years since an explosion and a fire on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico made Deepwater Horizon and things like blowout preventer and shear ram sort of household terms. Uh, and it began nearly three months of us watching oil pour continuously from the seafloor into the ocean. And just to be clear, we're not here to celebrate this anniversary, uh, but rather we want to take this moment just to pause and reflect on that particular moment in time and on the period that followed, when it sometimes seemed like the oil might really never stop and that our world was changing before our eyes in some fundamental way, much as it is now. We also want to remember that for the families of those who died in the explosion and for those who lost jobs or businesses or even families, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was more than an environmental crisis. It was a personal disaster and some it's one that some have yet to recover from. So our thoughts go out to everyone in the Gulf today as well. Uh, our guest, as I mentioned, is Chris Reddy. Uh, Chris has spent much of his career studying oil spills and the complex ways that oil behaves once it enters the ocean. Of the more than 100 people from the Oceanographic Institution, myself included, who responded to the Gulf of Mexico over time, Chris played a particularly visible role. He wasn't just a member of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, but a member of the community of scientists who went down and worked in the lab to shed light on virtually every aspect of the, fill, of the spill as it was unfolding before our eyes. Chris also made dozens of trips to the Gulf during that time, and he was the scientific liaison as, at the Incident Command Center in New Orleans beginning in the summer of 2010. While he was there, he helped uh, frontline responders and leaders of armed for the armed forces and federal agencies who were there to understand and apply the knowledge that scientists around the world were providing them. Uh, Chris also testified before con congressional committee several times. He briefed lawmakers at the federal and state level and, 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 and local level. He met with community groups and individuals all along the <coughs> Gulf Coast throughout that time to help them better understand what was happening over the horizon and deep in, deep beneath the surface. Um, Chris, before I throw it over to you, I, I wanna ask, you know, 10 years ago on, on this day, what were you doing and what went through your head when you first heard that there was an explosion on an oil rig and there might be a, an oil spill beginning? Um, thanks, Ken. I actually uh, thought it was gonna be a diesel fuel spill because uh, I didn't know about the broken well and, and the rig had about 800,000 gallons of diesel fuel. So I was uh, more interested about uh, what was on the rig as opposed to what was going to be flowing out of the bottom of the seafloor. And then of course we learned more that it was a much more um, difficult situation. All right, why don't you pick up from there? Tell us, um, tell us what you learned. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Ken. And um, you know, thanks to all my colleagues here at Woods Hole to, uh, who got this webinar going. And uh, thank you for your patience and your, and your time and, uh, and commitment to uh, hearing about um, this in this webinar. Um, I, want, I want to start off by uh, recognizing that it's the 10th anniversary uh, of this uh, unfortunate event, um, but it's, and it's important to the lives and livelihoods of people who are impacted and the loved ones of the 11 souls that were lost. Um, but from nature's perspective, this is just the 10 years later, um, how nature responds to an uninvited guest, like an oil spill, nature works on a completely different scale of a different set of uh, calendar and clocks 
and how it decides when it's going to do and not going to do something. Um, and so just, just when we talk about this science and what we're seeing, we have to remember that this is just another day um, from a scientific perspective. Um, the other thing is today I'm gonna to talk about what I, my opinion about a lot of points. Um, this is, there has been thousands of research papers that have been written and, and there's no way that I could touch upon all of them and in many respects, what I'm trying to do is uh, give you my views and, and opinion. Uh, and this is no, by no means a review of the work that's been done. And then, you know, the last is that um, even with these thousands of research papers that have been done um, from this, from this post this event, we're only reporting on what we could see or measure and then, uh, and then discuss. Um, you can't put the Gulf of Mexico in an MRI. And so you're limited as to what you can discuss and present. And we have to always keep that in our minds, even as we go through today. The, the takeaways, uh, this was an unprecedented event. This was very much a natural gas uh, release and an oil spill. Nature, uh, I think the Gulf of Mexico overall demonstrated its resilience and uh, how it responds to this uninvited guest. I learned as a scientist, uh, oil spill scientist about the importance of how sunlight can affect the sunlight, uh, the oil that's on the surface. And, you know, please take this in the right context. Uh, I am certainly not denying uh, the injuries and the damages that occurred, but I think of the grand scheme, uh, the, we dodged a bullet. Um, when you place yourself what we're seeing and dealing with in April and May of 2020, and what a lot was said on the news and TV, and even in my mind as well. Deepwater Horizon was a rig that was uh, not too far off ashore in the Gulf of Mexico. It uh, was tapping a well called the Macondo well. Um, and on April 20th, due to a series of events leading up to it, in including um, technology as well as leadership, in management style and even thereafter, uh, this explosion occurred uh, and, um, and we lost 11 souls. And on the right hand side is uh, an image of the, of the rig on April 22nd uh, before it, it uh, toppled to the bottom of the seafloor. President Obama put together an impressive uh, commission uh, immediately after, soon after the, uh, the disaster occurred. And within one year, they put together a, a comprehensive and actually startling um, report um, on, the, on the outcome of this and, and, put, and also made recommendations uh, forward. Uh, I highly recommend you, you look at this report. Uh, it's extremely well done and still timely uh, today, even uh, 10 years later. A precedent is often used uh, when we discuss this, uh, this disaster. Um, and it certainly was. And we had 87 days of sustained release at 5,000 feet below the seafloor. Somewhere around 160 to 200 million gallons of oil was released, as well as a significant amount of natural gas. And 1.6 million gallons of dispersants was used. Uh, a little more than half of it was in a more traditional manner on the surface of the ocean. And the remainder was injected at the bottom of the seafloor, which was a, a, a new approach um, at that time. And again, I want us to reflect on the 11 souls that were lost, the 16 other people on the rig who were hurt, and as well as all the lives and livelihoods that were impacted by this event. I wanna go back and I wanna really draw down about complexity. The Gulf of Mexico is a complex location. On top of that, we had not only uh, oil and we had oil and gas being leaked out from the bottom of the seafloor, more than leaked. Uh, and on your left hand side is an image of the, the riser pipe, the, 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 uh, the shared off the wellhead of the Macondo wallet. So this is right where the action was occurring. What you're seeing on the left hand side is the flow of petroleum uh, fluid, the reservoir fluid. And, and if you could take that apart, you could see that um, it, it was a significant amount of natural gas. And uh, depending on how you uh, consider it, uh, um, it was either 84% natural gas and a much smaller amount of liquid, liquid oil, if you think about it in moles, which is a chemistry uh, approach. Uh, from a mass perspective, it was about two thirds oil and about one third natural gas. 
the key point is, is that this was not an oil spill. This was an, a petroleum fluid spill of both natural gas and oil, which um, is critical when you look back at all that's been done and, and underscores really the significance and unprecedented nature of this event. I want to come back and, and even uh, go even one step further on the complexity. Uh, oil is complex. It's not a single entity. It's made up of thousands of different compounds. And as I mentioned earlier, we can only uh, learn and tell a story about what we can see and measure. And, and while that's relatively limited, it does afford us a lot of information about this complex mixture that's in this oil drop here. And the compounds that we can't study and we use um, are, are fascinating because they each have a different personality. They have a different behavior in which they, when they're released to the bottom of the ocean floor, they, they all choose or they have options as to where they wanna go. And they all have different susceptibilities uh, to be attacked and also a certain sense of recalcitrance, how tough they are. Um, and some can stymie nature and last for a long time and others are, are quickly uh, 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 taken down by nature. So we had a complex mixture of oil and gas released in the bottom of the seafloor for 87 days. This was very much um, a disaster fit for oceanography. And it's important to drive home that this was a spill that was outside what was usually thought of from an oil spill science perspective. And it was critical and it's great success about um, the basic science component of oceanography that played a, a critical role, especially in the early stages with funding from the National Science Foundation and uh, other federal agencies. Many scientists who did not study oil spills but were pre-adapted uh, to study oil spills made a significant contribution. And, and I, I think it's important for me to recognize Mandy Joy at the University of Georgia, who was right on the forefront, who studied natural gas, but from a, a basic science perspective, not oil spills, uh, but got in there, uh, made some great contributions and uh, inspired a lot of the scientists to get into it. Again, not only did NSF play a critical role early and before, but in the immediate stages after, they created a significant amount of funding that allowed scientists to study what was happening the first couple months. With that knowledge and what we knew, it was uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, was able to expand on what was learned then with a uh, Gulf of Mexico research initiative, which was $500 million um, from BP uh, that lasted for 10 years. Collectively, there was a tremendous amount of science. A lot of it was brought on the shoulders of basic ocean science funded by uh, our government agencies. And a lot of it also was related to hydrothermal vents, which are uh, uh, volcanoes on the bottom of the seafloor and how we could use uh, analogs to that. One of the, um, one of the uh, big issues that was happening um, immediately um, after, uh, after the event occurred was understanding how much oil was flowing from the bottom of the seafloor. It was uh, unknown uh, how much was being released. There were some numbers early on, it was confusion after that, there was a call for scientists to try to make a best estimate of uh, how much was being released. And this is a, a video that um, shows uh, a way in which Rich Camilli um, was uh, making measurements. Hold on just a, just a second, Chris. We've got to uh, figure okay. out why... Oh, Chris, you need to stop sharing now. This is different from okay. the way we, we practiced it. Okay. Okay, Craig, no, you should be able to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Just for um, everyone so, out, out there, we, we have a team that's working on this all, all at once. So go ahead, Craig. So, um, so what I'm showing here is uh, what Rich Camilli did, a colleague of mine at Woods Hole Oceanographic. He was able to uh, attach a device on a remotely operated vehicle that was able to get on site and... Uh, make measurements on the diameter or how much was getting flown out of the bottom of the seafloor uh, with, uh, in this case, the, the, there's a pipe that's been shared off the riser pipe. Uh, it's either open or, in this case, he was making a measurement when there was a kink here. Uh, 
But what's important is he was able to measure and, and conclude how much oil, reservoir oil, the oil and the gas, reservoir fluid, was getting released from the bottom of the seafloor. That's, that's valuable. But it, as I mentioned earlier, this was a release of oil and gas. What was needed to be done next was to get an understanding of how much of that fluid was gas and how much of it was that in oil. And in the next video, uh, there's a one way that this was uh, approached. And uh, this was, again, based on the, on the, on the back of, of hydrothermal vent science. And this is a, a device uh, on your right-hand side that was developed by Jeff Seewald. It was a device used to study um, hydrothermal vent science. And what is happening on, is on your right-hand side in the center, is a device that's getting brought right into that boiling, boiling cauldron of oil and gas coming out of the well. And it that sampler was able to grab oil and gas, that reservoir fluid, safely and in a way that it kept its integrity so that it could be brought back to the lab, that, that device, all the way from, from the bottom of the seafloor up to the boat and all the way back to its hole where the amount of oil and gas was calculated. That allowed Rich to take the information that from these two videos and make an estimate as to how much oil and gas was, uh, how much oil in particular was getting released from the bottom of the seafloor. He had a rate of about uh, 2 to 2.8 million gallons a day. That's very much in line with a wide variety of other numbers that Marsha McNutt uh, and colleagues concluded in a synthesis paper. So uh, while we're switching back over, I just wanted to uh, quickly poll our audience. How much? So how much oil do you think ended up in the uh, in the Gulf of Mexico when all, when all was said and done? Um, you guys are coming in. Yep, ninety nine percent of you got it got it right. Chris, why don't you give us the 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 real answer? Okay. Sorry. Can hey, you guys see me? I think so. Ah. Well, um, if you uh, look at the tail of the tape, it was about 200 million gallons were released from the seafloor. But about 33 million gallons immediately after it was being released from the well or, or close to it uh, was collected by BP. And so the, uh, the flow rate was how much was coming immediately out of the well. Some of that was collected and about 160 million gallons of oil was released into the ocean as well as the natural gas component. So you have 167 million gallons of oil getting released over 87 days, 5,000 feet below the seafloor as well as the natural gas. Where's it going? What's gonna happen to it? I wanna take you through uh, uh, where the oil went and, remember, and the gas. Remember now, oil and gas, all those components have different personalities and traits. We're gonna see how that plays out when I show you these layers. So first I wanna, uh, I'm, in this slide, you can see the deep water horizon marked with a star. And in that pink area is a cumulative amount of oil that was seen on the surface, which is what we typically think about oil spills. Where, where is the oil on the surface? Well, you could visually see if you flew over with a plane. That's how far I went. It's significant. I mean, all the way to uh, into the waters off of Florida. Now, let's add another layer. Some of that oil that immediately reached the surface and before uh, it got spread evaporated. A lot of it actually, probably 30 to 40%. So if it made it to the surface, that oil, a lot of it, the compounds that are the most volatile evaporated very quickly, 30, 40%. If it didn't evaporate, it spread out. Now, a lot of us have heard about uh, these subsurface plumes uh, that were very hot topics. Uh, and, and this was a, a component of the material that was coming out of the seafloor and, and had taken a turn to the Southwest. And it was enriched at about 3,300 feet. And it was enriched with most of the natural gas components. So, and, and, and so let's stop here again. 
Some of the compounds never made it to the surface. They stopped at 3,300 uh, feet or so. They went to the Southwest. So those were the compounds that actually didn't mind being in water and, and other characteristics. Some made it to the surface and was immediately evaporated. And then some stayed on the surface. Some didn't even make it or eventually found themselves back on the sea floor. And th that's in that little box. And then some that was on the surface eventually reached the coastlines. What I really want to drive home, and this is what's most important to me from a scientific perspective, is the direction and the distance traveled of the, of the different components that came out of the seafloor. And if you could, if you, if I could show you the chemistry of the different components in these different shape files, you would see that they differed. And they differ because of their personalities. Now, what's not really captured in this figure is uh, how long it's lasted. Now, that subsurface anomaly in the yellow uh, didn't last after two or three, four months. Um, the oil on the, sea uh, oil on the seafloor is still there. Uh, so you also have to understand not only where it goes, how far it goes, but how long it may last. The point of the matter is, is that we had a complex environment a complex mixture, and we had a complex outcome as to where they were going and where they went. I've given a lot of oil spills, uh, talks on oil spills. Uh, even if they're not on the deep water horizon, uh, the first question I'm usually asked is, what about the dispersants? It's a good question. Um, about 1.6 million gallons was uh, used. Uh, I've had about 160 million gallons released, so about 1%. Um, it's hard for some folks to wrap their heads around the idea that you're going to use a chemical to fight a chemical spill. Um, and again, re um, returning to what I had said earlier, uh, a little bit more than half of the oil, uh, the dispersants that were released was put on the surface. So it was a very mu much more traditional way. And then uh, a little less than half of it was uh, injected at the bottom of the seafloor. So it was very non-traditional. When people ask me this question, it's, uh, it, it's, it's necessary to break this question down. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step through you, step through the way I, my approach to this. Question one, were the people and the folks who were at the incident command in other locales qualified and experienced to make a well-informed decisions about using dispersants? Yes. Did they uh, develop a plan and, and based on good science and their experience to use dispersants? Yes. Did they prevent good arguments to use dispersants in the subsurface, which was very unusual? Yes. And in fact, one of the big drivers as to why they uh, pushed to put dispersants in the bottom of the seafloor was, was to improve air quality. And the argument was, is that it typically dispersants are used to break up the oil droplet, oil into small droplets and, and let nature beat it up a little bit more. But in this case, using dispersants on the bottom of the seafloor, the, the argument was is that it would improve the air quality, that more of those compounds that you, that you might want to breathe and that could damage and hurt responders would be trapped in the subsurface. And based on anecdotal evidence and several multiple, several um, models, it shows that the air quality was better. To me, that means there was success. So the plan was to improve air quality, importantly, and it, and it did. It, it helped lives. That means you did not have to be wearing this type of garb and personal protection gear as much. It allows more folks to be on boats and decks in theater work on this response and make this unfortunate and bad thing not as bad. Stop it from getting worse. Again, in the last 10 years, countless studies have been looked at dispersants. I'm certainly not discounting them. A lot of them have raised flags about potential problems that occur with them. And, and those should be considered when we start to think about the approaches and how we move forward. But looking back, it was the right decision and the arguments for using it were uh, supported. So we put nature on a treadmill. What we've learned is, is that there are certain areas that, uh, that can either be cleaned up relatively easy or clean up themselves relatively easy. Uh, 
Um, the beaches, you could bring in a bulldozer and take away the oiled sand and, and replenish it. On the flip side, there were areas, in, in particular the deep sea corals, which was a, a very unusual, a, a new finding, were impacted by oil that uh, in the area, uh, in those areas, as well as the salt marshes. Salt marshes have been well known to be impacted by uh, oil spills, but the corals were a new finding. Again, coming back to this concept of, of an oceanographic um, um, er, spill. Both of these locales are areas in which you can't bring a bulldozer in. It's, it's, it's too delicate of, a, of, a, of, of ecosystems and, and, and they grow too slowly um, to get in there and be heavy handed. And the end result is, is that these are areas that are still feeling it. What's important is, is when, when you're asked about the Gulf of Mexico, you have to break it down into certain areas and ecosystems. Uh, a global statement when you're we're looking for fine details uh, is, is, is not appropriate. What I learned the most for me, walking in and looking at the spill afterwards, was just how, uh, how important sunlight was when it was acting on the oil that still stayed on the surface. So if the if a compounds that made it to the surface and they didn't evaporate, they were floating around, potentially ended up being on the coastline, in that process, very quickly, in, 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 in the course of days and weeks, sunlight beat it up and transformed it into whole new types of products. This is certainly unprecedented and new and will be, will be used and thought about uh, as we move forward. What's amazing to me is, is that um, often uh, folks think about microbes as saving the day uh, during oil spells. They most certainly did in the subsurface. They did a fantastic job breaking up those natural gas compounds that were heading to the Southwest at 3,300 feet. But if you made it to the surface, didn't evaporate, sunlight really kicked on it, much, much more than microbes. This is a new finding uh, and certainly we have to consider it in the future. And I, I wanna come back and not sound too cavalier. It's easy for me to be up in Cape Cod and, and, and discuss the Gulf uh, but if you, you look back about what, uh, what was being said by pundits and, and, and my colleagues, and, and, and fairly so, I mean, it was, a, um, it was apocalyptic. Uh, um, and so there was a lot of thoughts that this was going to be worse. And, and in my own mind, I thought so. Uh, and it only lasted 87 days. And while there are still damages, and I'm not discounting them in any way, the Gulf has uh, showed again its resilience. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that happened. To me, I think two points that are uh, mentioned sometimes, but does, do not get as much attention as they should, is, is first, I want to touch back about when you hear about buying houses. It's about location, location, and location. The location of this rig was uh, close enough to uh, land that it was allowed to bring a lot of assets and people and boats out and available to help make this response and, and stop this from getting worse. But it was not too close that it completely overran the coastline. I mean, certainly it, we saw a lot of oiling, but it would have been much worse if it was closer. So we had just a physical uh, location. On top of that, this was a location that is well known for petroleum. And there was, so you had a standing stock of knowledge about the, the, how the petroleum systems, petroleum engineers, petroleum geochemists, uh, and everything that's assorted uh, that goes with uh, recovering oil uh, as an energy product. Gulf of Mexico uh, was a mature uh, field. Oh, critical point here. Gulf of Mexico was a populated location. There were bodies there. They allowed, the, they, they allowed to accommodate uh, visitors. It also meant that it means that, that there was an infrastructure that existed that could handle all these people who were coming on place and trying to help, that could bring in uh, talented folks around the United States and the world. They were able to, to get to certain locations by roads and airports and deep water ports. All of this, all of these, all of this was able to make this bad thing from getting worse. Remember, I was just thinking about where the oil went on the coastline. You had to be able to access all those locations. 
This is a very important point. Now, for all of us, we work on our bellies. We need food. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not joking uh, as much, but uh, you got to eat. And um, just as a point, here are all the waffle houses that uh, you might could have stopped at as if you were trying to help out. This sounds kind of kind of a little maybe a little too cute, but uh, think about if we had a release in a location that uh, did not have this infrastructure. If you don't feed people, they can't stop this bad thing from getting worse. And as people ask me what I think should happen moving forward, is to remind uh, people that infrastructure and location are critical um, as we think about um, future oil spills and also how we handle any crises and pay attention to them and, and make sure that we continue to support them. On top of the infrastructure, which I think is the most important, was people. Again, forgive me for using, um, we dodged the bullet, but in, in my context, we, we dodged the bullet if you consider what could have happened in, in, in April and May. There were frontline rock stars. These were officials from the government and industry who had trained and planned for years. Some of these folks were uh, cut their teeth in the Argo Merchants Build, not too far from where I am in 1976, they responded to other major events of oil releases around the world and all the many small ones, including the 8 million gallons that was released after Hurricane Katrina, although in discrete locations. The point of the matter is, is that these frontline, these great talents, the, these responders, the ones who make decisions that weren't so easy sometimes, but ended up making a bad thing from getting worse, they're the heroes. They're the folks that we don't hear about that much. Looking forward, unfortunately, a lot of these folks are, getting, are retired or retiring. What's most important to me when I think about future oil spill science and how we make, <clears throat> excuse me, a bad thing from getting worse is to continue to hire more uh, and, and keep this, this great army of respondents intact, continue to support them, to educate them, help them build um, fruitful relationships with academia, to have uh, an exchange so that in the future spills that we can uh, make a bad thing from getting worse. It's, it's about people and it's about frontline responders who make a difference. So it would be <clears throat> unfortunate, it's hard to even make a comparison to the Deepwater Horizon to the, into the pandemic. Um, but it's the frontliners here who are also gonna make a bad thing from getting worse. Often they're not celebrated, they don't get the attention, but they're critical for a success in, in this time. And so I look for you to also think about how we can support them, but also think about what the talent they have and how we continue to support their well-being in their education if we have to deal with another um, outbreak or another medical crisis. We have tempered a wide, wide population of people. We have to continue to support them now and in the future so that they'll be there for the future. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate your time and, and hang in there with us. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we've, uh, we've gone past the 1130 mark that we said we All would right. stick to, but that, um, you know, there, there are a lot of questions that we would like to get to. So if everyone would uh, um, like to stick around, we're going to, we're going to get into some questions. Before I go to the questions from the folks who are tuning in, I wanted to pose one of my own. Um, you know, one of the things that's always surprised me is that um, oil spill science is still relatively new. It wasn't really until the late 60s when there was a spill right here in our backyard in Cape Cod that people, uh, uh, scientists turned their attention to the impacts and the recovery of ecosystems. And I know, Chris, your lab has been very active in looking at some of the marshes um, just up here uh, in the coast in Buzzards Bay. And I was wondering, what you're seeing from those studies, uh, what those studies are telling you that we can expect perhaps in the Gulf 20, 30, 50 years from now? It's a good question. Um, you know, first, you know, going back to this location, 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 mm -hmm. um, 
you have to be very careful about making comparisons. Uh, this was a diesel fuel spill that happened in 1969. Again, not too far from where I live, where some really talented scientists uh, uh, kickstarted uh, a lot of great science. And uh, 50 years later, there is oil still in some parts of the salt marshes. You can still smell the oil and uh, it's still impacting um, some of the plants and animals nearby. It's a very small amount and it's in a very tight location. So will, will oil possibly be still in some of the salt marshes in decades to come? Possibly, um, but you never know. Uh, nature might be different down in the, in the Gulf Coast but it's going to be a small amount. And that's always something that we have to be careful about. You hear things like, oh, the oil's still lasting, you know, 50 years later. And it's, it, that may be true, but it's, it's, it's much smaller than what we envisioned initially. And so uh, there's a certain sense of accuracy and precision that you need when you discuss spills. Uh, but it's entirely possible that's gonna happen, that you could have some long lived oil in certain areas. Again, it's based on the but location and also the type of compounds there and, and how, how tough they are. Um, Barbara asks uh, on, on Zoom about the loop current. That was one of the things that we heard about yeah. very early on. You know, was the loop current going to bring oil around Florida and up and train it into the Gulf of Mexico? Um, tell us a little bit more, if you can, about what happened to that particular phenomenon. And uh, somebody else asked, I think, sort of what was the difference what were the different factors that were driving that surface plume and the subsurface plume? Well, the, the loop current is a surface current that uh, uh, moves up through the, the Gulf of Mexico. And, and, and based on some of the thoughts in past research, it was entirely possible that that current could have picked up some of the oil that was on the surface and then transported it east and then through the straits through Florida and, and potentially bring it up along the east coast. And there was significant concern. Um, you know, based on nature and, and, and luck, uh, the loop current never reached farther up to, uh, to grab any of that oil. Uh, but there was a concern. It was also, the, it was good that we had a lot of good physical oceanographers that were in front of this problem and, and be aware of it and, and to think about it. Yeah, I remember uh, Breck Owens at, at, at Woods Hole, he was getting daily text up, updates from a glider that they de deployed very quickly and to get a sense for what was happening physically in the in the ocean there. Yeah, um, and you know, I don't <clears throat> I don't want to beat the drum too loud, but it's another point to uh, how basic oceanographic science was brought to bear to uh, yeah. to move the ball forward here. Uh, Maria on Facebook asked, "Are there still uh, monitoring and ongoing studies in the area of e the ecosystems affected by this by the spill?" Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely in the salt marshes, uh, especially. But yeah, I mean there. Are, um, you know, it depends on who's doing it, but there's a lot of my colleagues who are keeping an eye on in areas because um, in many cases, it's, it's, it's because nature is affording us this opportunity to uh, see how it responds. And, uh, you know, for me included, uh, I, I go down to the Gulf to see where the oil still is. And it, it's very small amounts here and there, uh, but I'm fascinated about the compounds that still persist. Uh, it gives us some insight on basic science but if you start to look at the compounds, you think about them and build them with like tinker tots. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at their structures, you can learn a lot about how tough they are and use that knowledge in, in designing other chemicals. You know, do you want a compound to last for a long time? Well, you build it this way. You don't want it to last a long time, then you know, make sure you don't put this little piece uh, that uh, makes oil last for, a compound last for a long time. Rennie on Zoom asks, what are, well, I'm going to add to this a little bit saying, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what are some of the, the next steps? What's the, what are the, the next unknowns for oil spill research? Um, and I want to ask sort of, uh, what, what things did you learn that you've already applied? Can you ask the first question first? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm going back. That's okay. A <clears throat> time for you. What was the first one? Um, what are the, the, more, the most immediate unknowns in oil spill research? What is sort of the, the, the cutting edge? What are people studying? I think um, getting a better handle <clears throat> in planning and, and using um, dispersants is valuable. I think uh, developing technology 
that allows us to uh, study and, and get in front of and responding to spills when you're not afforded uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> and I think, um, you know, uh, the sunlight component is a big deal. And, and also some of my colleagues looked at how um, um, some of the oil could um, get transported back to the seafloor, which was also a new finding uh, called MOFSA. And uh, I'd also look at that as well. Okay. Um, we got a, a question on Zoom from uh, Joyce and George. They're asking if there's any connection uh, between the oil spill and if people, uh, if there's any connection between the oil spill and the uh, recent developments in harmful algal blooms. Have you seen anything about that? It's funny, I, I read a lot about that this weekend <laughs> to uh, prepare. And so thank you for uh, making work that out. The Gulf is a is a, an inundated location um, and it's it's difficult to even disentangle what types of impacts the, the oil spill had on the ecosystem. Um, so I think it would be uh, difficult to even try to tie uh, uh, harmful algal blooms back to oil spills, uh, but they certainly are related if, uh, if the science points out that uh, human activity has, uh, in, um, has <clears throat> increased the amount of harmful algal blooms and, and locations. Uh, it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, but I would say that they're not necessarily connected uh, and from, from a chemistry perspective and a biology perspective, but uh, they're both related to human activity. Um, from Facebook, uh, Pasalakwa is, uh, is asking, what were the atmospheric uh, effects of the, of the spill? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> Some of the best science that was done uh, after this event was uh, was done by atmospheric chemists. Uh, my friend Tom Ryerson, who's with uh, NOAA, was able to fly a plane uh, over the site and uh, make some really impressive measurements about uh, where the how much compounds and, and what evaporated. And then, along with his other colleagues, was able to uh, look at the chemistry that happened in the atmosphere, which is a whole other type of of science and uh, they, they, they saw a lot of breakdown products and other aspects and where it transported. Um, it's, a, it's a whole other dimension um, that where those compounds went and how they were acted upon. But it was studied, um, but again, it, it's hard to study um, aspects of an event when you're uh, logistically in, in a challenged. Uh, it's hard to, uh, to study something in the atmosphere when it's moving around. Uh, but what they did was very good, very good. Um, Don from Zoom is asking sort of a related question. He was uh, wondering a little bit more about photooxidation. How is, is, is this different from evaporation? What's happening to the oil? When the <clears throat> um, you know, I have a lot of smart friends who could help me out with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where walking. are you, Colin? Um, <clears throat> yeah. uh, photooxidation has, you know, think about... Uh, you know, if you if you left uh, uh, you know something red in your backyard, and you can see that the the color has faded. Uh, it's uh, what it, what, it, what you're seeing is is that the sunlight has a, a capacity to attack uh, compounds either directly or with a little bit of help of something else uh, in the in the ocean. And what happened in this case was that a, a significant amount of those compounds uh, were acted upon. Uh, indirectly or directly by sunlight. And they and exactly what happened, it was a photo and then oxygen was added um, to these compounds. Uh, oxygen is usually only a trace amount of oxygen in many of the compounds that make up the oil, uh, but a significant amount of the compounds were oxidized. That actually changed the color uh, that you can often see. It, it was much more orange. And it also uh, changed how it moves, how it broke down, uh, how possibly it might get broken, <clears throat> eaten by microbes. And, 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 and Colin Ward nicely showed that uh, it may even uh, affected the, uh, the efficacy of dispersants, that uh, oxidized compounds uh, don't disperse as, as predicted with when it's not oxidized, uh, the kind of the native component. And I, I believe this is one of the bigger findings from this, um, the science that's been done. Uh, Pat from Facebook, this is, this is going to be an interesting answer. So um, multifaceted answer. How would this spill have been different if it had included, if it had occurred in some place like the Arctic? 
<laughs> well, well, I mean, go back and um, pick a place where you think an event might happen and uh, try to draw those same uh, layers. Oh, and, you mean the layers? Uh, be, and, you're limited oh, by infrastructure, yeah. but but there's, there's more to it. Even from a chemistry perspective, um, <clears throat> and forgive me for getting too much of a gearhead, uh, but but when you get into colder regions, um, how much evaporates and doesn't evaporate changes when you're in colder regions. And so even the chemistry changes a little, but I mean, ultimately, if you're in a difficult place, if you can't get there and get in front of this problem, and you can't bring in the bodies that you need, and you can't put ships on the way, and you can't bring ships in theater, yeah. uh, then you're going to have a much longer event. Uh, so that's one thing. I think the Arctic is often pointed to, uh, and there's no doubt that it's susceptible for release of a, an accident. My personal opinion is, is that uh, the, the first uh, oil spill that is going to uh, have a of impact uh, in the Arctic areas is uh, is probably a diesel fuel spill or a fuel oil spill from a ship mm -hmm. that um, runs aground or has a problem in, in a, an enclosed area and has a massive release in a, in a small area. I don't think it's going to be from an uncontrolled uh, um, well. In fact, there's not many being recovered up there now. Ray from Zoom is asking, um, how does the Deepwater Horizon spill compare to the amount of oil seepage that occurs in the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico uh, naturally? That's a really good question. Yeah, you might want to yeah, set that up a little bit, let people know what, what the seafloor is like. Um, sure. Um, in certain areas of the world where, there's, uh, where oil happens to be in excess in the, uh, below the seafloor, uh, you have oil production and then it's, it's collected in reservoirs. You can have cracks in the ocean floor that allows some of the oil to uh, meander up in this torturous path and, and naturally seep out into the seafloor. Mm -hmm. This happens on land, La Brea tar pits. If you're a, a sitcom TV person from the 60s, it's uh, how uh, from the Beverly Hillbillies, how Jed got rich. He found uh, yeah. a natural oil seep. Um, either way, the Gulf of Mexico has countless amounts of natural oil seeps coming out of the seafloor, these little tiny cracks. They're different. The, the volume is, 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 is significant. Mm -hmm. But what is different between a natural seep and this event was the, that the, the amount of oil that was getting released was concentrated at one location. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, as a, as a chemist, is that naturally, oil, naturally seeped oil and it's in it in its path from the reservoir actually gets beat up pretty hard by microbes and so it's actually a, a, a much different component uh, a composition of oil than what was getting leaked from the pipe so it's dispersed over a much wider area and the chemistry is a little bit different much different actually uh, and there's other factors and you know there's lots of good work that's been done uh by colleagues on that uh, on that work dylan on facebook asks um would you be able to speak more to the ecological effects of the oil on uh, the bottom, particularly uh, benthic invertebrates? I know that's probably um, something that, uh, you know, one, you, you could use a call a friend on that one, but yeah, the best, the best of your ability. What, Why don't we, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I could answer it and then, <clears throat> Uh, they take my PhD away. So why don't we uh, <laughs> we'll cue that up with some of my fr smart friends. All right, we'll try and we'll get we'll you try on and answer that offline. Yeah. Uh, um, what about um, some of the salt marshes? Do you know how how things are, are faring down there now? You know, I, I, I'm not as on top of it as I should be, but I mean, it's certainly it's still oiled. And I think uh, what's important is, is that, uh, uh, that we're, we're, you know, every crisis is an opportunity, and I should be careful saying that, but uh, there is a lot of good science that's being watched and, and looked at and seeing how the, the marsh responds and, and how it may be eroded or not. So uh, I can't speak to exactly how it stands right now, uh, but it is being studied and, and, and a unique opportunity to, uh, to see how marshes respond. Um, Kylie is asking, can you tell us more about the, the sensor that was used to collect samples of the flow um, oh, yeah. um, that was on the, the arm of the ROV <clears> there? Yeah, that, uh, that was a device uh, uh, built by uh, Jeff Seawald, who's in my building. Um, and Jeff is a, a geochemist, and he was very interested in 
some of the natural gas components and other materials that uh, is made in around hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the seafloor. What made that sample so special is that the, the housing where the oil and the gas were held was in titanium, in a titanium uh, container that's extremely strong. Um, because you have to remember that um, at the bottom of the seafloor, there's a, a tremendous amount of pressure. And that pressure allows to keep the gas kind of really tight and, and, and compacted. If you used a not so strong uh, sampler and you try to bring a, an intact sample from the bottom of the seafloor up to the surface, it would explode. It could not hold the, the, the desire of that gas to expand and, and explode out of the container. Uh, but Jeff had the insight and the knowledge to, to design what it's called an isobaric gas tight sampler. Uh, and uh, he had the insight and the knowledge to build these devices so that uh, they could hold the integrity. They also could be safe. Um, and it's a, a really technological marvel. Yeah, I remember being in your lab when we um, when we got the yeah. well when we got the sampler back, um, mm -hmm. but also then a couple of weeks later when when it was open, yeah. and I remember yeah just thinking that thing is containing a little piece of the of the ocean from five thousand feet below. Mm. That was that was quite quite. It was uh, nerve wracking. Thankfully, Jeff uh, uh, ran that experiment and not me. I think I just took it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> thankfully, he's a lot cooler than I am. Um, a lot of people are asking about um, the dispersants, yeah. as you can imagine. <laughs> um, I know there was a lot of concern about the, the nature of the product that was used. Yeah. But can you speak more about it? I think it was, was it called Corexit? <clears throat> yeah, Corexit is a... Uh, is, uh, <clears throat> Is a dispersant. It's a, a formulation of a, a wide variety of uh, uh, compounds that was made and designed so that it could be an effective dispersant uh, and help break up oil into small droplets and, and accelerate its breakdown. Dispersant science had moved very far forward. Uh, we often dispersants. Uh, Initial, uh, initial formulations were uh, not ideal and, and had a lot of drawbacks. Uh, Corexit was refined to a point where uh, it was uh, considered a very good product and a lot of it was stockpiled. There are compounds uh, in the dispersant that uh, could create our harm uh, in, the, in, in, in our balance sheet. It's not necessarily when we think about uh, whether or not there's a problem uh, in my eyes, it, it's not the dispersant, it's, uh, it's what happens, what I would call the dispersed oil. So uh, what are the drawbacks to uh, when you add uh, dispersant and it does its job, how it may affect the ecosystem? Uh, it's a, it's, it's a non-trivial discussion. Uh, but again, I don't want to sound uh, too apologetic and, and too supportive of the uh, uh, industries. Uh, but this was a this was a product that was well designed, well tested, and you know there were two National Academy of Science reports uh, already on dispersants out there. There was a significant amount of knowledge that existed, and you know I think one other thing that we want to put together, and <clears throat> my wife knows more about psychology than me, is I'm always amazed about why folks are so fascinated uh, and ask about the dispersants. It was relatively one percent. I'm certainly not uh, dismissing it, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know I'm going to draw a, a, a comparison to the amount of chemicals that are used to put out forest fires from planes, and it's a much higher amount. And both of those approaches are to make a bad thing from getting worse. And mm -hmm. this is one of the great challenges: is uh, is 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 dealing with uh, the 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 feelings in the in, of of adding a chemical to a chemical spill. In this case, I think it was the right decision. Yeah. Uh, but we can use a lot of knowledge in the future uh, to make it even better or not use it at all because you don't need to use it if the circumstances stand. Yeah, I think different. the point was that this was a decision that had to, had to be made in the, um, the heat of battle. It was a good one. You know, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think we, in, in fairness, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with trying to stop a well mm -hmm. that's leaking. And then also trying to manage what was getting on the deck and where it was. Um, 
multiple uh, stresses going on. And you know what happens in science and how responders uh, make decisions is you know well grounded in science, but you got to run with what you got to run. Uh, if there was one drawback uh, to me from this using dispersants, especially in the subsurface, was it would have been really great to have. Uh, kind of an ongoing science experiment, uh, controls, all the things that uh, we like to have in our labs. Uh, but, you know, this is the difference. When you're dealing with a crisis, uh, you're not, you have to make a decision. You know, are we going to try to make this better? Or are we going to try to have a project? You know, in the future, uh, uh, if presented a different, same case, I would, uh, I would strongly encourage to have uh, an ongoing and, and well-designed experiment to as best as possible to uh, to get a better handle on how what things are going, what things are doing, and the success of it uh, in near real time as best as possible. That dovetails nicely to a question on Zoom from Timothy. He's asking about funding for oil spill research. Yeah. Um, you know, is 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 there adequate funding for looking at the long-lasting effects of the spill? You're asking a scientist if there's enough funding. It's <laughs> that's always dangerous. Uh, no, no kidding aside. Uh, <clears throat> the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative uh, of five hundred million dollars over ten years um, did an amazing amount. Uh, led to a lot of amazing research, and uh, unfortunately, now we're we're stuck with some really great findings uh, that should be continued to be studied, but the the funding is is limited. Uh, mm -hmm. There's funds out of the National Academy of Sciences who are uh, uh, looking at other aspects, but it's available. There's certainly other um, government entities and, and others looking at um, the science of oil spills, but it's gonna be a much, much uh, smaller um, smaller support than we've, we've had for the last 10 years. Um, I do think that strategically, uh, how we fund research in the, in the future uh, has been, um, has been tabled by the findings and the synthesis of the, uh, a lot of this science that's been done in the last 10 years is being put together, already been synthesized. Those synthesis, syntheses of 10 years of science are really great to be used to guide future science and much more strategically when you have limited funds. So yeah, do I wish there was more funds? Yes. Uh, if the funds come available, I do think we can make really good decisions about how to invest in the future. Well, let's, let's put it this way. Are the funds being allocated in the right ways? No, I don't know. You know, I, you know we're, we're going through a massive transition, um, mm -hmm. you know, coming out of an unprecedented amount of money that was put forth to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we'll have to see how it plays out. Yeah. Uh, Jamie also on Zoom is asking about uh, whether the what are the assurances that the leak was permanently plugged? That's a little bit outside of my, my world, but uh, from what I know and what I've seen and what I've spoken to, I, I think it's about as, as buttoned up as, as possible and, and mm -hmm. in a similar manner to the many other wells that have been um, you know, <clears throat> decommissioned. So I, I, I think that uh, it's in good shape. It's a good question though. It's not often brought up. Yeah, yeah, we forgot. Um, is it? Do you know? Is it regularly monitored? I don't know. Um, I don't know. All right, you can check that out. Somebody's got to tell us. Uh, oh, yeah. No, we can find. That's that's easy to find out. <clears throat> it's a good question. I'd like to know. Yeah. Do you know it was the uh, the the material that was collected by um, by BP? Was that quality enough that it could be refined? I don't know. I mean, uh, they, you know, they burned off most of the natural gas and, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's what on the, on the screen you're seeing now that those flames are uh, the system, the boats that were recovering that uh, part of that 33 million gallons, they were getting uh, gas as well and they were burning it off. I'm assuming that it came, the, those, those boats were filled with oil that, um, you know, it was used mm -hmm. thereafter. It would be yeah. a shame if it wasn't, uh, but I, you know, I don't know where it went. Uh, but it's a lot of oil, you know, 33 million gallons is a lot of money. Well, we have uh, reached noon. Um, we have over 120 questions on oh, Zoom alone. Yeah, I think we're <laughs> going to have to call it here. Um, but 
I I want to thank you, Chris, for all the work you oh, did and that you're continuing to do uh, yeah. to better understand Deepwater Horizon, you know, and, and the inner workings of the ocean. It doesn't just touch on one oil spill or oil spills in particular. It reaches across the board in ocean sciences. Um, I will also want to thank you, uh, the audience who tuned in and who was so active with your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed this, you might want to come back Wednesday evening at 730 over on our YouTube channel where we're going to premiere a new short film entitled A Window into the Twilight Zone. We'll be joined by the filmmaker of that, Jennifer Berglund, um, as well as some of the members of the expedition that the film follows as they attempted to explore something called the ocean twilight zone just beyond the reach of, of sunlight. Uh, you really don't want to miss it. It's, it's a wonderful piece. Um, also, don't forget, we have more information about Deepwater Horizon, um, the ocean twilight zone, and dozens of other topics on our website, whoi.edu. If we didn't get to your question and you, uh, you, know, and you, want, you have more burning questions to ask, you probably find answers there. If not, we will try to get to some more of your questions um, uh, once, we, once we sign off. Don't forget also while you're there, you can sign up for our e-newsletter to get regular updates of information about the ocean. You can uh, join us on social media where we uh, put out a regular stream of, of information and, uh, and engaging content. So you know, be sure to check back on the website, learn more about our one and only ocean. I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Chris. And yeah, everybody. Thank you. Oh, thanks. And take care. Be healthy, everyone.